Hello, everybody, and welcome. I am. Can you all hear me okay? I'm admitting people as we go along here. All right, great. I see the chat. Hello's in the chat. Fantastic, wonderful. Um, I am so excited that you're joining us tonight. Um, and I want to go ahead and um, begin by introducing myself. Um, and my name is Shelly Sokolowski. Um, I am, I'm getting all these little things popping up. So I'm, I apologize here. Um, my name is Shelly Sokolowski and I am part of the faculty within the textile arts curriculum at Portland State University. For those of you joining us from outside of the university, the, tech, the textile arts curriculum is an elective track in the BFA art practice program that provides an interdisciplinary approach to the study of clothing and textiles. We are wrapping up the school year, so this is the last of our events for the 21-22 season. And if you have missed any of the talks, feel free to check out our event archive. And you can find that in the psutextilearts.com slash events. Uh, site. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge we are joining you all from Portland State University, which is located near the heart of downtown Portland, Oregon in Multnomah County. We honor the indigenous people whose traditional and ancestral homelands we stand on, the Multnomah, Clathamit, Clackamas, Tumwater, Watlala Bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. It is important to acknowledge the ancestors of this place and to recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. In remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. This evening, we are so thrilled to have Vovo with us. Vo is a Portland-based artist and radical educator of 11 years in over 20 countries, educating in inclusion, racial justice, intercultural communication, trauma-informed care, de-escalation, and transformative justice. Their recently initiated career as a visual artist has seen them primarily work in textiles, embroidery, weaving, and furniture building. Their installations seek to interrogate power dynamics, structural oppression, challenge histories and realities of imperialism, white supremacy, and colonization. They continue to explore support strategies and models of community care within post-traumatic social landscape, focusing on the resilience of BIPOC, LGBTQIA2S+, and disabled communities. Vo is visit visiting us in conjunction with my digital weaving course to discuss their practice and work, including work done on the TC2 loom. Vo has prepared a 30 minute talk, uh, which we will follow with a Q&A. So while you have questions, feel free to pop those in the chat and we'll circle back around at the end of Bo's talk um, and answer your questions. And with that, I would love to uh, introduce you to Bo. Cool, thank you, Shelley. Hi everyone. Um, first of all, thank you for joining me on a Tuesday evening at six o'clock. Um, the weather has been you know, pretty nice today and I really appreciate you choosing to be inside online. Um, for this time. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, so I, often I kind of give like different talks and this one, um, I'm, I've kept the scope at kind of giving you a background on um, maybe my textile work and maybe kind of the context of why specifically I toy with the TC2, I guess, um, but I really hope that people ask whatever questions that come to mind. Um, and I do prefer interactive like, conversations. So yeah, just um, let me know at the end there what, um, you know, what you wanna know. Um, I, today in like making, putting this together, I was thinking about the word digital um, and digital coming from the word digit, which, you know, means fingers and hands. And I think it's, um worth just noting that as we talk about digital technology and its kind of relationship to our hands or to our um to our practice and uh, why the distinction even is there in the first place um okay so here's some context and um i'll come back to this image later but this is just the the first slide 
So some context, this is uh, from an article uh, in Willamette Week from, I don't remember, maybe October last year, um, or maybe earlier, <laughs> I don't remember. But um, just to give you some context around my political um, uh, situation, I guess, I've been an anarchist since I was 12. Um, so a lot of uh, my politics informs kind of the why and how I do things. Um, in June of 2020, you know, obviously um, there was a lot of conversation after uh, George Floyd's um, passing was televised so widely. And that um, led me to produce, to attempt to produce uh, one of my drawings um, externally. So with a company uh, on a loom and it, uh, long story short, um, they made one, which was the kind of the, the test. And this is the only one that exists. And um, about, I think two months after that, uh, after I'd already kind of paid for it and um, this, like I'd made all the sales of all the, of all the limited edition and, and had already donated all of that money to the Black Trans Fund, the company left me a voicemail saying that they couldn't um, produce it. They, they didn't want to make the situation in Portland worse is the, is the quote that they gave me on the voicemail. So in, in essence, I was censored, um, but not only that, um, there was a kind of a judgment call about what Portland is or was um, and my role in that. And um, there was just a lot there. And also it was kind of a shady business practice to like hold onto my money for two months and then um, take two months to, to tell me that they weren't gonna make it. <clears throat> but they said that they already started production and then they stopped production, which I found even more weird. Anyway, so that is all to say that I realized that um, as they say, you know, maybe keeping the means of production um, kind of within your control has benefits. And um, uh, a upholsterer I know from North Portland um, told me once, keep it all, keep it small. And both of those kinds of thoughts um, came to me after June of 2020. And, and I thought, yeah, okay, I will keep it all, keep it small. And I will um, go back to like, making sure that I'm the person making stuff because I can't rely on um, these external sources. So that's the context. So this was shown in a show uh, of uh, that was started, I think, in February of 2021, and it closed in April of 2021. And the, the, the show was at Full of Rosen Gallery, and it was about um, things reflecting from June 2020 to up until the invasion of the Capitol building on in January. So the, the work was processing a lot of that um, that was happening. Okay, so that's some context. This is some details <laughs> from the piece. And in the past for, for Portland Text all month, I kind of started off with it describing <laughs> describing this work and I that's when like a lot of people left. <laughs> So I totally understand if people want to leave because this isn't for everybody. But um, yeah, this was the work. And the show was called Things That Have to Do With Fire. So I am an abolitionist and obviously um, my work reflects that. Um, so the other things that were considered in the show when I was preparing for the show in January of 2021 was the aesthetics of urgency. <clears throat> so um, where does technology kind of live or what is the machine's role in urgency? You know, when you look at things like this, it's like immediate, it's the hand, um, it comes out of kind of what's available to you. So yeah, thinking again around immediacy, urgency, and also technology. Um, this is one like viewpoint of, of the installation. So it was all, it was uh, either, there was two woven pieces and then the rest were embroidered. So these are all embroidered. Um, the other things that I considered were color as a political tool, symbols and slogans and hashtags, uh, space and theater. So how do how do how does space lend to theater and um, the kind of dynamics of power and its relationship to the authority of the state? 
So here's an image that illustrates the, the, how color is used as a political tool. Um, 20 years ago, 22 years ago, was the beginning of how, uh, how political parties started to use um, color coding uh, to kind of divide the, the perceived um, political conversation. I won't go into it, but anyway, <laughs> but I used color when thinking about voice and thinking about what, um, whose voice I was speaking in for the show. So this isn't a progress piece um, using the democratic blue. And then one more kind of, um, one more kind of uh, detail. And um, I used purple a lot to, to, to kind of talk about things that were outside of a two party politic idea. Um, so this is just some detail from the, that show. This is a quote um, from MLK Jr. Large segments of white society are more concerned about tranquility and the status quo than about justice and humanity. And this was obviously in reference to the ways that property was and is still prioritized over human life in Portland. Um, yeah, so another detail. And this is the image from the beginning so it's a larger detail, I guess. And it's, this was a process. So there was more dye and paint um, uh, kind of overlaid onto this, but it's a, uh, an embroidery of the Panopticon of the Capitol building. Um, and just some words that I wrote um, and illustrations that I made. And it says no mas muertes. And the reasoning is to kind of draw lines between like who was permitted to, into spaces and who was not permitted into spaces, um, and also who's kept inside of spaces out of the public view, i.e. incarceration. Um, and the text reads, ignorance abhors a vacuum. Okay, so that's kind of, I wanted to start there because that is the reason why I now dabble with the TC2, I guess. Um, also, I think this panel shows that I had, from coming from an illustration and comics background, I've been drawing for eight years um, and had always wanted to explore how I could draw in large scale. And I think that this last eight years I've just been working towards that really slowly. Um, so playing with embroidery in this, in this show. And then um, this is photography. This is embroidery on the right here. Um, so I think five by five foot piece. This piece on the right is um, part of the public works uh, with, this, with the, I think Portland Parks and Rec now. And it's my grandmother and my mom cooking side by side. And the in, image on the left is a photo of my little sister, my mom and my grandma, who's now passed away. Um, and it's a photo, you know, printed on silk. Um, but again, kind of, you can see where I start to uh, play with ideas of kind of image and textile. Um, and I guess the context socially is that, you know, I come from a refugee family, a lot of kind of matriarchs who were also industrial workers who spent more time working than parenting, I would say. And also um, all of us had roles in sweatshops, me included, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, the other context is that I'm from New Zealand. I was uh, raised in New Zealand um, and Australia. This is some Merino sheep. Um, this image this next to the sheep is when I was born my mum worked in this factory Feltex carpets so she worked on industrial looms and spent more time with industrial looms than you know her child which is me um, and so I've just known her to be an industrial worker my whole life um, and you know never saw the inside of any of these factories. Um, the bottom is Politech where she also worked for several years until it closed down in 2015 so that's a that's the, the, um, the loom. And then those are some of the textiles that it produced. And then the, the top right is Brooks Brothers where she worked up until it closed down during COVID. So I'm, I'm naming these things because at least the two American companies, Feltex was in Australia and New Zealand, but Politech and Brooks Brothers, I feel like some people would know them if, they've, uh, if they're familiar with textile industries. And often people aren't familiar with kind of maybe the people that do the everyday, you know, long kind of slog um, in the factory floor there. 
other contexts and I guess where I'm at um, in terms of my practice, you know, uh, the introduction um, could describe that I was, I'm an educator, I still am an educator and that's what I've been doing since 2009, so 13 years now. Um, I've been, yeah, like I said, and then in the last two years is when I started weaving. Um, and uh, where I'm at is I'm a kid of two refugee machinists, the birth of my parents, um, thinking about how certain production, factory work and man manufacturing is seen as a function of class. So, you know, looking at the difference between how both my parents were a cog in a machine or um, were very deftly like able and capable of, of using these, these industrial looms, um, but how that is not seen as an art form. Um, witnessed how BIPOC and immigrants were kept at lower levels, were subjugated, keep, kept out of the bigger picture or um, any conceptual work they were just doing, right? And so that's part of the kind of system that keeps them um, away from the kind of the higher level uh, C-suite jobs, um, even though they're the most skilled. And again, thinking about this term unskilled labor, labor and how that's kind of <laughs> misleading because um, there's, the, what's what we call unskilled labor is actually quite skilled um, and how that translates to looking down on specific forms of making so you know what does it mean for me to come to terms with potentially choosing to spend eight to ten hours a day at a machine loom um, after seeing how that's kind of worn down my parents bodies and witness how bodies and time are exploited um, how people's skilled labor and work um, is exploited for capitalism and profit including myself as a child in a fashion sweatshop. So um, kind of in my late tens and early teens, uh, I also, um, me and my family also participated in several different sweatshop systems, I guess you could say, um, and worked from late at night uh, from home for different very large sweat fashion companies that you would recognize the names of. Um, uh, and again, that's how I learned to sew, you know, uh, so that's something. Um, so what does it mean to reclaim work for myself, you know, uh, which culturally it's frowned upon, like to being an artist and doing stuff because I want to is kind of seen as self-indulgent. It's seen as a middle class pursuit, like a waste of time, as opposed to a working, a good working class pursuit of doing this for someone else. Um, even if it's a mode of expression or a mode of survival for me, it's still not seen as something that's legitimate in the same way a, a full-time job would be. And uh, reframing, I'm reframing art and craft as joy, as labor of love, rolled up with all of these above construct, uh, constructions culturally. <clears throat> and then again, I'm now like uh, thinking about the line of, between machination and the subjugation of my own body, right? So how do I still look after myself whilst also doing this thing that I really love, which is weaving. So some context, you know, I self-taught like two years ago, I like taught myself how to felt. I taught myself how to do like very um, like rudimentary uh, weaving on a handmade, on a loom that I built. Um, I taught myself how to knit. Um, I just like, I just explored these things without any guidance um, to see what I, resonated with and this is the very first thing that I wove on the floor loom. Um, this is a piece from 2020 um, that speaks to the refugee uh, tents in the camps that my parents lived on uh, for almost a year and where I was conceived in Thailand. Um, so these are um, structures that you know um, or created, and then uh, some of these pieces on the side here are um, different people of color or immigrants or refugees uh, in my community that all kind of contributed a piece that was um, all kind of compiled in this work. Um, there's a lot to this, I won't go into it, but it's called Occupy Refuge. Um, other two works from 2020, you'll see another machine woven piece here, which I'll um, discuss shortly. And I also, um, I also kind of sew garments in a very non-traditional way, which has been frowned upon uh, of late also. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, these are some details from that piece, which we'll talk about shortly. And this is a piece, this is a building that my piece is in. I actually saw it for the first time yesterday. Um, I, I like knocked on the door and asked if I could take a photo. Um, so it's a Nick Fish building in East Portland. Um, and it's called Hope is a Long Game. This is, I think, I've forgotten how many feet it is. I want to say 22 feet long. Um, okay. And then uh, I think my most recent public piece, this is in the Mackenzie Gallery in Saskatchewan, in Regina, sorry, um, in Canada. And it's called Provisional Structures. And it's about um, physical accessibility and um, other types of accessibility with, um, within like the art, the art realm. Okay, so that's giving you some context. I just wanted to like uh, kind of build out like the world around, you know, what I do on the TC2. And now I'm going to show you some experiments on the TC2 um, and kind of the things that I came to terms with, I guess. So back to that piece I showed earlier. Again, I'm going to place the, the digital next to the, the so-called digital next to the to the woven piece, just so you kind of see how things translate. I think coming from like printing, you know, doing risographs and stuff, I think it's really weird to kind of expand a timeline from being able to print things so easily and quickly to you know spending a couple of days like 16 ish hours on a piece on one piece and they're all one offs so that's interesting okay so some analog um things that i didn't expect was that every loom even if it's a machine has its fingerprint um so there, there's these heddle hiccups that were really specific to this specific loom and i guess in every single piece that i did you could see you could see this um, thing happening in one kind of like column um, and how that would be become like a future archival signature of this machine. Um, looking at human error. So this on the left here is where I just chose the, I just like did the wrong shuttle uh, at the wrong time and I left it in. Um, and then also here is another mistake down here. Um, and also thinking about how tension changing. Um, so this like boucle, this wool boucle was very fine. Um, and yeah, uh, again, things that you don't quite expect. And then playing with different um, different plies in the colony, the British colony will call them plies. Um, I forget what they're called here, weight, different weights, I guess of yarn. Um, but I was working with eight and 10 ply um, yarns and seeing kind of what different textures they create. And then going with the flow, so like, you know, discovering that there were color combinations that I really disliked, like this one, but I'm like, oh, I'll just, you see what happens. Um, looking at all the glitches kind of from the machine to machine, I guess, communication. Um, and then also leaving that in. And again, um, when you, when your warp is very different uh, in, in, in ply to your weft, then, you know, the, the scale and the ratio of your image changes, but you'll probably, you probably have discovered that if you're studying digital weaving. Here's an example of that. So these were meant to be circles, but um, I hadn't factored in kind of different ratios. Yeah, so working with circles was fun for that reason. Um, and yeah, and playing with colors. Again, I was like a very much black and white comic illustrator. And then suddenly um, in the last six months, um, playing with color and realizing that I don't, I don't mind color. It's, it's pretty cool. And this is the first thing I ever did on the TC2. And I wanted to play with long floats just to see what um, textural, you know, I just wanted to push and see kind of how archival it would be. Like, would it, would it just fall apart? Would it still last? Um, and yeah. And Piece definitely has like a very specific identity because of because of those choices. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like 
a very quick run through of some of the stuff that I've done, stuff that's specific to textiles and kind of the why. And I wanted to just ask you all some questions to consider. You can answer them if you want. You can write in the chat, you can unmute. This is partly a test to see if anyone's still there um, listening, <laughs> just kidding. Um, but I think I, you know, I do like to relate to people and it is weird talking into um, my own computer, just I'm staring at my own computer. There's nobody there, there's no pe people, you know, I'm alone in a room. So these questions are partly to remind myself that I'm actually in relationship with humans in this moment. Um, so yeah, how does your history or context bring you to the artist that you are today? Um, for you, what is the relationship between machine and human? Um, where is the space for your hand? Uh, for, for where's the space for error and where is the space for humanization in your work? Do you depend or, on or embrace technology, for example, using the internet, your phone, use, wearing glasses, um, using tools like knitting needles, crochet hooks? Um, what is your relationship with different fibers and where they come from? You know, this is a huge question. So, um, and I guess I'm asking that as someone who uses post-consumer waste yarns, you, you can't see, but to my right is like a giant pile of yarn that is um, all post-consumer waste. And what does it mean for you to make the way you do or intend to make? So some of you, if haven't, you know, made yet, um, you know, how does that fit in your meaning? So yeah, there are just some questions. I don't know if anyone, if this brings up anything for anybody. Um, but, you know, before you all ask me questions, I just wanted to ask you some. Well, um, I'm going to call out my digital weaving students, please. Um, I'd love to hear your experience about using the loom and the machine. Um, I'm particularly looking at your relationship between you as a human and you and the machine. So question number two. Cool. Um, so I'm gonna read out some comments real quick on the, from the chat. So Maria Mejia wrote, thank you for sharing. For me, I like to center decolonization practices in my work, which to me means learning about the fibers I work with, the history behind the craft, etc." Yeah, absolutely. We understand weaving as um, a scattered indigenous practice, right? So different types of weaving coming from so many different um, uh, indigenous populations and, and understanding what which weaving comes from where um, and why, you know, it's usually it's climate related or ge geology, geography related. Um, and the colors obviously are to do with eco ecology. Um, so that's, yeah, important. And then also, unfortunately, fibers and the relationship of the history of fibers, especially on this continent. And where does, where does the cotton come from? What is the history of that? Where does the indigo come from? What is the history of that? So yeah, I think um, understanding about colonization and deco decolonial um, lenses when doing this work <laughs> is super important. Thank you for sharing that, Maria. Alison wrote, so interesting to hear about that company not wanting to weave your work. I've heard the same things happening with Spoonflower digital printing. Acquiring knowledge around making seems to be a way of disrupting these power structures. Yeah, absolutely, control the means of production. Maya or Maya wrote, I've noticed that when I use the Digiloom, I feel more robotic, like I'm going through the motions kind of mindlessly. I've also noticed this happens most when I'm plugged in and listening to my music. It makes me less present and kind of disconnected. Yeah, totally. And I'm curious um, if you can compare that with like floor looming or table looming or other types of looming, if you're plugged in for those or if you are more present or less present than those two. Okay. And, and they've written, I've only ever worked on a digiloom. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that there's like a specific sound to the TC2 as well, you know, the, the vacuum pump and the compression. So that it does lend to like a more machinated um, experience. Um, but I think, yeah, yeah. I'm just curious what, what other people kind of experience with this as well. I think that's very interesting because my experience has been the opposite. Like I feel like our uh, 
our loom has a very strong personality and will that it will frequently exert on whatever you're trying to do on it. Right. So whenever I'm working, it's like this, cause our, our loom, like a parts of it, like it's not, it's not threaded correctly. And so we have a lot of knotting issues. And so learning how to work with it, it's been a process, but it's almost been this conversation of short of sorts where when I go in and sort of, I'm like weaving a thing, it's starting out like, okay, Loom, are you going to work with me today? Like, what are we going to do here? And it feels less like I'm on my own because my other, my other really big weaving experiences is I've been a voracious, I've been a voracious knitter. And when I'm knitting, it's just me. And it's a very solitary task. Whereas when I'm working with the Loom, it's, there is, there is another factor that is completely out of my control that I'm working with. And yeah, yeah that's interesting. So knitting is interesting because it's like crocheting. It's, things simplified to the lowest d- d- denominator common common denominator right so you you're working with one loop at a time um <laughs> so you're making one single um kind of loop at a time and then suddenly you're kind of exploding to this multi various variable um universe where literally there are so many um things that could go wrong um i think it's interesting like yeah walking into a room with this giant loom and being like is the humidity okay for you? Is the temperature okay for you? Are you liking, you know, where you are right now? Are you, you know, because all of those things matter to it. Um, that's, you know, those things will change the likelihood of tension and nodding. So yeah, it is, uh, it is kind of funny having to kind of be, to, to me, like subject to it. Because when it does mess up, then you're suddenly like, oh, like, I have to placate this thing so it doesn't um, malfunction and not as well. Um, Reading through the chat again, um, Alana wrote, for me, the floor loom can make me almost overwhelmingly present and haven't used a digi loom yet. Yeah. um, Yeah. I think I've noticed personally that I'm present if there's like silence, um, but if I'm watching television or listening to audiobooks at the same time then suddenly definitely I that I'm I am more prone to mistakes on both the on both the floor loom and the digital loom. Joshua wrote I like using the digital loom because it creates a physical object out of the purely digital design it's not a print but almost a sculptural piece when it's done it's more satisfying than making a 2d print out of a piece of digital artwork totally I, I see it as a long print like personally coming from a print background but I do see it as like the you know an epic print um uh, that takes, yeah, like I said, 16 hours to complete. Um, Alison wrote, Vo mentioned not doing things traditionally and the last speaker mentioned not doing things correctly. Curious about where those ideas of perfection come from and how they inform people's work. Yeah, I, yeah, and I think, I think that's a good question if anyone wants to also answer that. Um, and I think that's why I brought up things about where I just was like, I'm just going to go with this. I could go back a few picks and undo this, or I'm just going to keep going with it. And um, what does it mean to like embody or embrace um, these so-called mistakes? Um, Nia wrote, I think the digital loom has become an extension of my body mind. I do a lot of risograph printing and haven't felt that same extension with those machines. I think something about the physicality of using the digital loom and the repetition is why. I feel that same extension when I paint or draw my brushes and pens and pencils do the same thing. Interesting. Yeah, and I, and I think what's fun is like, it's so different for everyone. Like I know that for me, like photocopiers and risograph machines for me feel like, again, another, organism that I'm kind of placating and and I do feel like an affinity with those for some reason I think it's because they've been in my life for so long um yeah it's not the same thing as like an extension of your hand like a pen would be or a brush would be or even a shuttle would be um but I definitely feel some kind of affinity bodily affinity with them too Nick wrote the TC2 seems vulnerable like a human I feel like I work it hard when weaving and then I have empathy for it yeah <laughs> And I think sometimes it's good to also pay attention to how your body is working <laughs> during those times. Like I said, I've definitely woven on the TC2 for like 16 hours straight and not even noticed it until I stop. Um, so again, how much are we, you know, negotiating or compromising our bodies for those big machines? So I'm going to stop sharing, but uh, this is, you know, um, 
time to also continue discussion or if there's any specific questions, I'll stop sharing now. And I'll open chat. Okay, so Alison wrote, do you make new discoveries about the images when they're woven versus when they're drawn? Yeah, so I think it's interesting. Uh, and I wonder if um, Joshua has similar observations when something is drawn eight by 10 or you know 11 by 17, and then suddenly it's woven to uh, six feet wide. Um, uh, it's a lot more of a commitment and it definitely like is an exercise in self-love in some ways like oh I, I'm not great of an illustrator but suddenly I'm giving this a lot more of my resources so I really have to like this thing that I've made um, and uh, yeah I think resolution is a fun thing to play with um, like you know one one uh, pick or one uh, one pixel of like of yarn um, and what that can do and how that can change into a drawing. So I think, yeah, things around resolution, um, just literally the space it takes up. Um, and then I think when something is a doodle, you know, it doesn't take, it doesn't feel serious or it feels like it's more throwaway or, um, yeah, you can't, you don't have to take it seriously, but then suddenly it just has, it just, has so much more weight in the world and then when again when someone else expresses a desire to purchase the work or, or like have the work in their home I'm like wow okay this was this was just like a mindless doodle and now it's like become an object with its own um it's become an entity with its own kind of uh life <laughs> Joshua wrote yes yeah, sometimes making artwork purely digitally can feel small Right, and then when it's transformed into a physical object, it can then feel especially big, a bit magical. Yeah, this is really satisfying, like like printing, but like I said, the epic print. Um, and yeah, a bit magical. Uh, and I guess other discoveries would be the way that fabric curls when different tensions are happening. And so you're like kind of wrestling potentially with something that you need to frame because it's like rolling up. Um, yeah, and then, you know, like I said, like some colors, color combinations just look yucky when you you finally had it done, you're like, what, what was I thinking? Or some yarns you think are gonna look cool and they really don't. So some of those things too. Any other comments or questions? I'm gonna just scroll up to make sure. Um, Alison asked this question around perfection. You know, I think that, again, it's like a dichotomy that I'm toying with knowing that like my, both of my parents worked in companies that had to meet these standards of perfection, like Brooks Brothers, um, Polytech. If there was a tiny, one tiny little snag, then, you know, you'd have to throw that whole, the whole like roll out if there was like a, a one row of snag, etc. cetera. Um, so yeah, again, playing with this, like this uh, holding space for this idea of these people in my life who had to meet a perfect criteria um, or else they would lose their livelihood. Um, but it was always someone else's, you know, command or someone else's idea. And then suddenly I'm the person, I'm my own boss in, in my realm and I can change what it means to be perfect. And I, you know, um, yeah. So it's just, it feels very powerful, but also very privileged to be able to do that. I'm looking at other questions. I think, Shelly, you had a, you had kind of a question um, for everybody. Yes, I was really asking about my students who are responding to you and they're talking about the loom. I wanted their experience about, um, about the loom and I find it really interesting that some of them are actually experiencing the loom as, as an entity um, and, and some something that needs care and a collaborator. Um, and it is interesting. So Maya, try it without the headphones to see if you can experience that. Um, that was, yeah. Got it, yeah. And then, you know, I don't know everybody in the room, but I really appreciate um, like a couple of you sharing, but you know, that question that I had, um, which was like, what, about your context brings you to the artist you are today or what 
what does it mean for you to be even like what you know there must be a reason why you came to this thing why you came to this machine why you enrolled in this class etc um and i'm just curious about what brings people to this to that decision for myself personally um my art for a very very long time has been inextricably connected to my mental health i'm a uh, bipolar too and I can't sit down and do technical art therapy, but the reason I could never be a professional artist because, is because I process everything going on in my head all the time through art and it is my therapy and it is something that I pursue. And as I've grown and matured and become more comfortable with myself and what my brain is, I'll find that adding like small nods to my mental, like, not planned, I can't tell if you tell, I'm wearing a shirt that has a moon on it. The moon is culturally, at least in Western cultures, very closely tied to mental health and mental illness, especially that bipolar disorder. So being able to go and make fabrics and make clothing that subtly hints to, to what I am and what I'm proud of and what I am for me has been a very meaningful thing that I've been able to explore over the past few years. And I've been really enjoying looking at in this class. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I don't know if I've ever met a weaver that didn't find it therapeutic. And um, I, I'm, yeah, that would, I'd be surprised, you know, if anyone came to it without it, it um, that holding that space for that for that person. But yeah, absolutely. The reason why I'm obsessed with it is because it is something that quiets my mind, you know, as someone with a lot of anxiety and OCD, etc. And um, uh and I love the one thing at a time. It's one row at a time, one pick at a time. Um, and for you know, someone who might get overwhelmed with like a big project, just thinking of it as like, just do the next thing and the next thing. It feels, it feels calming and less overwhelming. Um, yeah, yeah, and 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 it helps with being present for sure too. Yeah, and to add, to add to that, because um, I know that students are grappling with those tangles that are occurring, and and really just having to detangle two threads and the time that it takes and the massage that it takes and the touch that it takes to do that um, really is, is part of that whole process of being present and healing and, and moving things forward. And um, they seem like they're like your enemy, but really, no, really, it's not that way at all. Yeah. I always talk about power and power struggles and like, not just, you know, now I'm a parent and as a teacher, like, but also with a machine, how do you avoid a power struggle with a machine? Because a power struggle would probably make your life a lot harder anyway. So again, like, yeah, like you just said, Shelly, um, it's okay. It's like, I'm not, I'm not trying to fight it and I'm not, this is just also part of this process. <laughs> um, and, you know, how, how would that change my perspective if I didn't see this as a power struggle in this moment? Um, Sarah wrote, thank you, Vovo. I was wondering if there's a type of fiber that you feel connected, that, that you feel connected to more, to how your work is manifested. Yeah, I think that's a really hard question or interesting question. Like my, with my ethnic background, um, uh, so my family's, my family are, are refugees from the Vietnam War. Um, and so, and they're farmers. And I think silk is like something that is, um, maybe culturally um, prevalent. I wouldn't even say relevant, but it's just something that's around, especially embroidery work in, um, in like fine silks, in uh, ceremonial wear. So, and, and, machine, and even machine embroidery, um, like fabrics that are made by machines. So yeah, I think silk is something that is relevant to me and I love, I love it when it comes up in my life, but it's not necessarily... Um, the thing that I end up working with because one, I because I work with post-consumer waste, I kind of work with whatever ends up in, in my life. Um, but two, my first job was at a wool store um, in Australia and it was a store that was open for 61 years and had to close down because of the gov some government changes. Um, and as a result, we had an archive of wool and wool related yarns from for the last 61 years from Europe, from all these different places, um, from small and large farms. So as a teenager, kind of um, being introduced to this really epic archive of, of mostly wool, but also, yeah, like um, 
I'm including angora and alpaca and um, uh, you know different types of animals here. Um, but yeah, it meant that when I was 16, I was I was able to identify. I can still identify a fiber by how how it feels or looks like. If you show me a photo, I can pretty much tell you the makeup of that fiber. But definitely, if I touch it, I can tell you um, if it's what animal it came from or if it is a, a synthetic. Um, so that's all to say that um, when I was a teen, the job that I had by accident ended up training me um, very keenly in in like understanding um, the different qualities and plies and um, origins of, of different animal yarns. So that's probably the thing that I end up working with the most. <laughs> but thank you for asking that question. Yeah, and I think ancestral ties and indigenous ties and looking at cultural ties um, when we talk about fiber is really important. So that too. Um, I have a question. Uh -huh. Um, I don't really know how to word it, but mm -hmm. I'll do my best. Um, some of your pieces, like the one that's um, showing right now, are more like abstract and play with like textures. And I was wondering um, like how you come up with that kind of imagery. I'm, my work is like not, <laughs> like my, Brain just doesn't work like that. So I was wondering. Yeah. Well, that. I don't know what's showing right now because I, I, I just see all like everybody. Oh, I meant there. like showing, like you said, you had that like 22 foot long piece. Oh, right, right, right. In the, in the public building. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think for that one, that's my most abstract piece because it's a public piece and they, are, they I proposed two things. One was extremely like about um, kind of indigenous, indigenous medicinal stuff to do with um, to do with my knowledge around what is healing and my other one was this proposal for this very abstract piece and that's the one they chose and I was like okay all right I hear you you know public work is is sometimes um, the people want to be more general so yeah I would say my brain doesn't work that way either um, and I would say that yeah um, I definitely draw digitally and non-digitally uh, very specific things and usually quite political things or things that um, that say something or like depict some kind of you know message or feeling um, but I think moving into doing more public works I think you know that that unfortunately sometimes gets lost um, when it's you know being purchased to be displayed for general public um, but I think but I, de I definitely do want to say that I, de I definitely like um have always been a fan of like 20s soviet geometry so a lot of my work just happens to be quite weirdly geometrical um but I want to ask you Sarah like what you know what works for you like what are the oh not Sarah sorry Maya Maya um kind of what um like how does your brain work like what is it that you you end up depicting I guess um my that's a good question um and I wasn't expecting you to Sorry. <laughs> have me again um that's no, good I I don't know I think that I've always kind of just um like I, I draw a lot and it usually like what comes out is like kind of how I'm feeling if that makes sense yeah but in more of just like weird characters who like maybe comfort me or like personify like the feeling um but yeah I saw I saw that piece and I was like whoa like I don't like that was just so like different to see um but yeah yeah so I'm gonna share my screen real fast and like this is for example of a hand-drawn this is a drawing I drew in like 40 minutes and then I made it into a into a tapestry um it just drew it with a sharpie you know um so I think the my point in sharing this and showing that to you is to say that you can make any image really into into um a work on the on the loom on that loom um well, and that's kind of part of the the beauty of that class right Shelley um my question was um Maya I think you're speaking about that um 
public commission that you have, Fo, was that 20 foot or 30 foot long piece woven on a, an analog loom? Yes, that was a folding. And so Maya, that might be where you're not understanding. So it's a different um, sensibility completely than the digital loom, right? Wouldn't you say, Vo? Could you explain a little bit about the process of making that particular? I don't think it has to be actually. I think both of them, um, because you're working one pick at a time, I think you, they, both of them are open to the same kind of hacks and the same kind of um, the ways you can play with different, you can put yarns in different directions and, and have non-linear. Um, so I would say they're actually pretty similar, just the speed might be different or the, you know, and then the, and the TC2 obviously has way more capabilities of um, translating different images. Yeah, in terms of the images, that that's the whole point in terms of translating the images. Yeah, but you could definitely do a more analog looking piece on a TC2 pretty easily, I would say. The, 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 it just means, you know, um, yeah, like again, weaving maybe intuitively or like Sayori style or, um, and instead of having in, like something that you're following with the different shuttles, you just kind of put in whatever yarn you feel like. Um, yeah, hope, hopefully that addressed your question. Um, but I think hearing that you said that you draw characters and kind of um, these drawings, I, I sounds like you there's a lot of potential for you to translate those things through through the TC too. Um, Lauren asks, what is post-industrial waste and where have you gotten it? Um, Scrap is an amazing, you know, um, is an amazing uh, resource in Portland. I've got a lot of yarn and also fabric from there. Um, there's also and like two other places, and I've forgotten their names right now. One's in Seattle, one's here, which is basically like a, um, like not a dump, but it's like a, a, where people put waste and then you can like go there and, and buy stuff or grab stuff. Um, the bin, the Goodwill bins are great. I've definitely received a lot of um, donations, which has been really nice. Um, uh, I also kind of use like the off, the off um, pieces from like the, the Pendleton looms. Um, there's so many, there's so many different places you can you can source from. Um, yeah, yeah, but you know, hopefully that that answers your question. I guess the question also was what is it, and what I mean is, um, you know, like I. I, in my, in my existence, try really hard never to buy new things or to like, to um, rely on something that has to be created just for me to have it. I try to buy only things that already existed, like secondhand things, antique things, vintage things, you know. Um, and similarly with making work, um, I, because there, I just, my belief is there's just so much stuff in the world already and I, I don't need to get, buy new stuff to make more stuff. There's so much stuff that exists already that I can use to make stuff. So um, what it means is, yeah, using things that already um, I used and maybe people didn't use it all. And so it's just excess or it's um, like the off cuttings from another industrial process. Um, uh, so that, yeah, so that I'm not creating kind of uh, another system where things are being made. Um, excessively yeah hopefully that answers and I, th and I wonder if that is okay cool awesome yeah and I wonder if that's informed also from being working in a sweatshop as a kid and seeing how much waste goes into like into that industry where people are making new stuff for the sake of it and you just see mountains and mountains of waste um uh, when you're in that when you're in that industry so yeah so I just I just don't want to contribute to that Good question. Cool. Um, any yeah, final comments or um, reflections or questions? Cool. All right, over to, over to you, Shelley. Well. Um, I want to ask you one more question. Yeah. Um, so you're getting a TC2 now in your studio and 
um, you want to work really large, which um, I want to hear about why you want to work really large scale. And also um, the idea, I mean, this is something that I struggle with in my own practice. Um, when I work analog, it's harder to make a lot of product. And I love that and I embrace that because it's not wasteful. You're not putting more stuff out there. Yet when I work on the digital loom, it's easy to make product more so. And so how do you navigate those thoughts that, how do you navigate making more product when you're thinking about not wanting to like make more stuff? Yeah, I, I wanna, I wanna, um, I just wanna be specific is that I'm definitely making more stuff. I'm a maker of stuff. That's unfortunately the, my therapy. So I definitely am addicted to making more stuff. I just don't want to use new stuff to make more stuff. That's the main thing. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess when I was doing my MFA like two years ago, I just ended up um, working a lot in large scale. So a lot of the pieces I was working with were like 15, 16 feet wide or like, you know, for textile pieces. Um, and I guess my solo show was also, yeah, 12 feet wide pieces. I think that has to do with the kind of thinking around theatre and around public space or just any or private space, any space really, thinking about um, monoliths or like mon why, why I, mean, I like monolithic work. I like making monolithic work. I don't know why, um, but I think it comes from being a person who was being told to be, who has been told to be very small my whole life. And I think this is just like some kind of reaching beyond that. Um, and then, yeah, um, my, yeah, my machine is like the largest, I guess that you can get, like the widest you can get um, intentionally because yeah, I do wanna, I wanna keep playing with monolithic work just to see what, just to see what comes out of it. And I think, I guess the like fundamental answer to this question is because I wanna feel something when I, when I look at work and I want people to feel something when they look at my work. Not everyone will, but um, I think the scale, a lot of the scale of my work, sometimes I just bombard people with so much content and so much stuff that it, it's hard not to feel something, even if it's just overwhelmed, even if the feeling is just being overwhelmed. Um, yeah, but usually there is some kind of emotion that, that people have noticed when they come to my, one of my shows or look at any of my pieces. Um, so yeah, I just, I want, I would, I hope that people feel something. Um, and then I, like I said, I, I do one-off pieces and each one takes several days. So I don't feel like it, I don't feel like I'm really speeding up my process really in any way, actually, <laughs> personally, but maybe because I've, I'm just, I like, to work fast usually and to me the tc2 is actually slowing down a lot of my processes especially when threading and um and all the kind of like machine mistakes and all that stuff so i yeah i feel the opposite i feel like more inclined to be frustrated more inclined to be slowed down trying really hard to not have power struggles with the machine trying to be zen um, um and trying not to be pulled out of that meditative space that i really really cherish um, but I, he I hear your point and I, I guess those are decisions that I've made is not to mass produce anything, try not to make more than an edition of one, you know, in the future I might make editions of five or something, but I, I can't imagine that really um, go coming to that anytime soon. So I guess it's those decisions and param param parameters that I've already set for myself to avoid um, getting into a mass production space. That's great. Thank you. Awesome. All right, folks. Yes, Annan. Hi, Annan. Thank you. Um, if we have, gosh, I don't want to close us off now, though. This has been amazing. I'm really grateful for your visit. And I know, I know we all are. So um, let me just give another shout out for any more, any more chats, any more conversation. Thank you. Thanks. Glad to see all of you here too. Thank you for all the thank yous, everybody. Um, and thank you for your time and your presence and your attention. That's really appreciated. Very good. So 
Um, in wrapping up, Vo, thank you so much. And I, I look forward to meeting you in the real time. Um, it's great to meet you on screen. Um, and thank you for taking time to be with us today, certainly. And thanks to all of you for showing up. Great attendance tonight, great questions. Um, and before we end the session, I just want to remind folks that this conversation will be available in our event archive later this week. So we'll be sure to um, upload that. And if you want to revisit any of this conversation, watch it again. Again, that's psutextilearts.com slash events dash archive. I think Allison put that in the chat earlier this evening. Um, so we'll be um, taking a break for summer tour, summer term. Oh my gosh, it's almost summer. Um, but uh, we'll have a new round of programming beginning next October. So please tune in and continue to stay engaged with the website and our Instagram page. And thanks everyone. Have a fantastic, fantastic night. Thank you. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you, you too. Okay.